at this point, I'm suspicious as if a painting comes together too easily. I'm, I, I think, you know, have I earned this, <laughs> this work? My work, it, my painting has become fully abstract over a period of probably 25 years. As I moved toward abstraction, and I understood that there was a narrative undertaking in creating the work, but it was a nonverbal narrative, it had to do with form, texture, color, there has always been a form of storytelling in my work tied to you know, figurative traditions. So I began to think, where is that now in my work? Has it disappeared or where does it reside? I realized that words, while they're concrete and specific and render just like someone, you, you know, it could be done with paint and pencil and shadow. Words are a form of rendering um, that retains the uh, option of the audience to input their own life experience. It was a challenge for me to think about writing fiction. Could I place myself, you know, in this tradition? So I went back to what I knew I was more familiar with, which is the painting process. With this body of work that's now, I'm in my like fifth, fifth or sixth year of this you know, unstretched abstract canvas work, I was thinking, how do I get into that work? How, how is it that I connect and make, begin to make meaning there? And it, it, it comes from these Initial gestures, selections, choices, like what color? A color matches a mood, and you know, indigo blue has been a mood and a color that has been always important to me. So I was like, well, what's the, what's the comparable first foray in writing? And of course, you look to your journal. My quest was turning these like pinprick moments of engagement with words and with you know, my own experiences, and then crafting something that could be seen as a story. These small, um, these are literally pages out of a book. This was a novel that I loved. Um, Everything is Illuminated by Jonathan Safran Foer. And so I began slicing up the book and uh, using the same vocabulary of these open pores and this um, zigzag motif, which there's a, um, in the part of the, I think it's the hippocampus, one of the older parts of the brain, <clears throat> there's a series of neurons that fire, and if you track the firing of those um, neurons, they fire in a pattern that's almost identical to these zigzags. I thought of it as like a, an emotional orientating, orientating um, device, but it turns out there's sort of a physical um, correlation. And so I've continued with, um, another set of them where I start with a very large piece of paper and do this kind of gesture, Rorschach type pour, and then take the format of the book page and um, segment the, the piece, almost like looking at, it's like a genetic model. You know, the, the big story has this um, common genetic material, just like, you know, all we all do as humans. And it's going to in, be enacted each painting from these common gestures end up being quite different. You know, some are resolved very simply, some have more layers. You think back to the traditional model for painting, you have your, your window already defined. You've, you know, made a stretcher. It's, it, there's, there's no sense that that outside assumption will change. Bringing discrete elements from different points in time. Again, it reminds me back to back uh, the uh, the idea of you know journal moments that are meaningful that might take place over you know years apart or you know even weeks or months, and they somehow link. So it breaks down this continuity of time, which I find inspiring. <laughs> the small book pages are helping me come to a solutions, but also these elements where I will shrink them down, photograph them, and then begin to edit, literally, with the, um, these photograph components, try them out on this scale, and then, like in this piece, <clears throat> this is three panels. There's a seam here, there's a seam here, 
And so these three panels, I felt there was um, a correlation, a kind of spiral unifying element with blue. And they happened at very different points. This is from February. This is from maybe April. And this one was from maybe two weeks ago. And <clears throat> but I could see after assembling it that I need to go back and re-edit it, just like the writing. It's, it could be tighter. It could be more concise. What's really exciting is to see it get close and then know that it will be you know, sort of irrefutably stronger by you know, going back in and, and rebuilding it. In this, this body of work, one painting in particular was actually quite different from the other ones and had this red um, rain um, falling down through it. And it was, um, it was an expression of pure, unadulterated <laughs> like frustration and anger when I did it. I knew it was also beautiful and it was extremely cathartic. That, that sense of uncontrolled anger is something I have learned over many, many years to um, take note of and think, you know, are there alternatives to channeling anger and different things like that. So this painting, I felt like I needed to revisit this technique for sure. It's a vertical, it has a sort of, you know, directness about it. What if I bend the rain? What if I bend, you know, this outpouring? This is a really large piece of canvas that's uh, solid blue. And this, what I'm doing now in terms of shaking the canvas, the, the kind of requirement of this work is uh, why I do it. <laughs> like I, the engagement, it's, you know, I'm not standing at an easel making small gestures. This is like a full body um, engagement. I'm gonna go back to a kind of neon rain on this dark background because uh, it's revisiting that same idea of outpouring and connecting to emotion. So that's my next, next move here. She was seated at a work table, centered flat in front of her lay a thick rectangular sheet of white paper. She took careful inventory of her tools and supplies, touching the small glass bottles of ink and arranging the soft metal tubes of white gouache in the upper right-hand corner of the table. Just below them, she straightened her blotting paper, um, laid flat next to her pens and extra nibs, sharpened pencils, pointed sable brushes, and clean erasers. Feeling the pull of the paper, she brushed her fingertips across its skin-like surface. The scraping sounds carried across the lawn and through the open window, muting the peeps and trills of the songbirds. The crew raked the new gravel in rhythmic pulls, breaking intermittently to bark and brag loudly before resuming their work. She wanted many things to happen. The crushed rock spreading up the driveway next door was some kind of forward mo movement, just not hers. I was very inspired about this idea of time connecting these two babies who ended up being my parents, who you know intertwined with my life and my experiences and kind of circling back to my present life and how to kind of understand that. And ultimately I've you know created these two short fables that just like with my painting process, you accumulate, accumulate, and then, then you have to, at some point, begin editing, culling, um, and par paring down. You know, things like sadness and anger have actually grown to empathy and understanding. And I've seen that kind of play out in my painting as well. So even talking about it today, I can remember places where, you know, I wouldn't have been able to say that, and now I can. That phrase, she could be queen, safe within her castle for the time being, it's certainly, I can relate to that. There's a solitary aspect to creating and also, and I think it isn't so much that you need to be alone. 
but you need to, it's like a kind of permission to listen to your own voice.